Good afternoon. I have, in uh, behalf of my colleagues, uh, Vivek Shtipasan uh, and uh, Jack Warner and Simon Cherry, I would like to welcome you to this new seminar series in biophotonics and bioimaging. We have um, launched recently this new series with the intent of bringing together uh, scientists from across uh, the Davis and also Sacramento campuses um, and to um, bring together scientists and, uh, in an intent of cross-fertilization between different scientific fields supporting the area of uh, bioimaging and biophotonics. Uh, so this, uh, I would like to acknowledge the many sponsors of this seminar series which include the Department of Biomedical Engineering, the Comprehensive Cancer Center at UC Davis, um, the UC Davis uh, Optics Club, which includes the uh, SPI and OSA student chapters, the Center for Excellence in Translational Molecular Imaging, the Center for Visual Science at the Clinical and Translation Science Center, and the Center for Biophotonics Science and Technology. Uh, please note that there will be a reception following this uh, uh, seminar uh, just outside the auditorium and I would like to invite all of you to, uh, to join us, uh, to meet with your colleagues and meet the speaker. So over the past uh, decade, uh, one of the most uh, important and uh, high impact scientific developments uh, in the area of uh, tissue imaging is uh, the photoacoustic tomography and microscopy. And uh, we are pleased and honored uh, to uh, the speaker today uh, in behind this revolution and new discoveries in this area uh, is the first distinguished speaker in the Biophotonics and Bioimaging seminar series, Li Hon Wang. Uh, so Professor Wang is currently a gene and very distinguished professor of biomedical engineering at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, briefly, his accomplishments um, places him among the very top scientists in the world. Uh, his um, accomplishments include publishing over 330 uh, peer review papers, uh, articles, and three uh, textbooks in this area. Uh, he um, also received nearly $40 million in research grants in support of his work. And this includes prestigious awards uh, from um, NIH, such as NIH First, NSF Career, and NIH Director's Pioneer Awards. Professor Wang is also an editor in chief of the Journal of Biomedical Optics. He's an elected fellow of many prestigious uh, scientific uh, professional societies like uh, AIMB, OSA, IEEE, and SPIE. Uh, he's also received the OSA's. Uh, CK Miss Award and IEEE Standing Achievement Award. Last but not least, uh, uh, technologies based on his inventions have been commercialized by two companies. So please join me um, welcoming the distinguished speaker of the series, Professor Li Hon Wang. Thank you, Laura, for the, for the very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I visited this campus about 10 years ago now, actually, so it's nice to be back again to see a lot of changes, to meet a lot of old friends here. Um, so today I'll be talking about photoacoustic tomography. It's a new emerging technology uh, we're trying to develop. The major goal is to ultrasonically break through the optical diffusion and diffraction limits. I'll show you how. WashU requires us to disclose our financial interests with two companies which are commercializing photoacoustic tomography. They actually have products already. We're funded by NIH through the Office of Director, NCI, and NIDIB primarily. Starting from the motivations and challenges in our field in general, I'll be talking about two major incarnations of photoacoustic tomography, namely photoacoustic CT and photoacoustic microscopy. I'll close with a discussion summary. Why optics? You, know, you start with many image modalities already. Um, is there a need for one more image modality? First of all, it's very safe to use light 
because we're dealing with non acid radiation, non carcinogenic radiation, because the photon energy, photon energy is very gentle. A couple of EVs in most cases, not enough energy to ionize molecules. From a very fundamental level, the physics perspective, we know light occupies a tiny portion of the gigantic EM spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum, but that's the only portion that allows you to probe molecules directly. Uh, if you go too far, you're probing the you know, inner shells or you're probing the nuclei. As a result, we can use light to measure essentially all molecules. The four major classes of biomolecules, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and others. Light has been, has been used to provide in vivo functional imaging. Examples include concentration of hemoglobin, oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, blood flow, in vivo metabolic imaging, such as the metabolic rate of oxygen, glucose consumption rate, even in vivo molecular imaging of many biomarkers, reporter genes. Recently, we were pushing in vivo label free histologic imaging. As we know, conventional histology requires excision of tissue labeling of the tissue slides. Here we're going to bring that in vivo. We can image cell nuclei and cytoplasm to match the standard HG staining in histology. The list actually goes on and on. Where's the challenge? In addition to diffraction, as we know that diffraction means you can get land over two resolution when you do your best in focus and light. A major challenge is photon diffusion due to the very strong scattering of light in tissue. This movie shows how photons scatter in biological tissue. You can see that within the first millimeter or so, there's a substantial amount of light that's still traveling as a group. That's the regime where we define as ballistic or quasi-ballistic regime. Beyond which, you have very few ballistic photons to work with. So we define that regime as the diffusion limit that translates into about one millimeter, which correlates with the transfer of the path. That's the mean distance between equivalent isotropic scattering events in tissue. If you look at standard ballistic imaging, they will provide penetration depth up to about this diffusion limit. Technologies you've heard of include planar, confocal, two photon, microscopy, and the OCT. Because they depend on ballistic or straight propagating photons, the one over E decay constant is about 100 microns. The rule of thumb is you can penetrate 10 times that one over E decay constant. So that 100 microns translates into about 1 millimeter in scattered skin. Using photoacoustic tomography, we try to overcome this issue. You got to use multiple scattered photons to penetrate deep in scattered tissue. We've demonstrated up to seven. In an ex vivo situation, you can even go deeper, like eight uh, centimeters so far. The reason is that we don't depend on ballistic photons. We're using multiple scatter photons to penetrate. The scattering diamond is absorbing, in fact, in the photon propagation process. Okay. So if you tolerate scattering, the absorption isn't too bad. The Walbury decay constant can be increased to multiple millimeters. You multiply that number by a factor of 10, you can potentially reach about 10 centimeters. Right? So that's the power of this technique. While photons, once they get scattered, how do you recover spatial information to get a good image? That's the key challenge. Let's take a step back and look at what it takes to get a good image. Right? You, if you mimic x-ray projection, try to get a good shadow gram, you won't see it by using visible light or near infrared light. Because the photon path will be so tortuous, any shadow of the middle plane structure, for example, will be blurred. You're not going to get a shadow gram like x-ray projection imaging. Now, hypothetically, if you cut open the tissue 
to expose the middle layer, despite a tortuous path for elimination, the detection path will be well defined in a ballistic fashion. All of a sudden, you can see everything in the middle plane. The point I want to make is you only need one sided clarity. So you don't have to you know, slice open the tissue for both sides. It's like on a cloudy day, we can see each other outside, even though the illumination is uh, scattered by the clouds. You can still see each other because the receiving path is well defined. All right, but that's not very useful for imaging because that's invasive. You can do a little better by using optical clearing, by introducing <coughs> osmotic agents. You can turn the tissue almost transparent. Right now, you keep the tissue intact. This side comes transparent. You can form a very good image as well. But this is a toxic process, so it's hard to use in vivo. <coughs> a much better idea is to convert light into sound. Acoustic signals propagate in a clear fashion. The scattering of ultrasound in tissue is orders of magnitude weaker than optical scattering. At least three orders of magnitude. Now, by listening to the sound induced by light absorption, you can get a very sharp image in scattering biological tissue, optically scattering biological tissue. However, you retain the optical contrast. So you have access to, access to all these advantages I just talked about by using light as your probing form of radiation that gives you all this molecular contrast. Right? That's the advantage, because you're combining optical contrast with acoustic resolution. In a single modality, you're physically combining them. <coughs> In a way, you're listening to an optical image, as opposed to looking at optical image. As a physical phenomenon, photoacoustics has been around for quite some time. Alexander Graham Bell first reported photophone over 100 years ago. Instead of doing a telephone, Right. He said, well, let's build a photophone. The idea is to encode a sound wave into a light beam, then propagate the light beam in space, convert light back into sound again through this photoacoustic effect occurring right here. In the photoacoustic effect, light is first absorbed. It generates a temperature rise. Due to thermal elastic expansion, you convert that heat into acoustic wave. Well, Bell was a lot interested in the audible frequency range just to transmit your sound. We are interested in ultrasound frequency range. As we know, the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength, the better the spatial resolution. So, of course, tomography was not even in a lexicon over 100 years ago. Um, so we're combining this extremely old physics with a very modern imaging concept in a single modality. Here is a, 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 a very simple summary of what's going on. We detect pressure, but that pressure rise is proportional to the temperature rise induced by light absorption. And that temperature rise is proportional to the optical absorption coefficient. So that means by detecting a mechanical parameter, we're actually getting this information about the optical absorption coefficient. So we're probing optical contrast by detecting ultrasound pressure. Right? So that's the bottom one. And you can see here because the signal is proportional to absorption, so that means we're very sensitive to absorption. Right? A 2% change in your absorption coefficient will translate into a 2% change in your signal. So from that regard, it's a one-to-one -one mapping the relative sensitivity, what we call, is like 100%. In some other technologies, if you don't measure absorption directly, the sensitivity becomes very low. For example, confocal or OCT, they don't measure scattering. If they don't measure absorption, OCT measures scattering, while confocal can be used to measure scattering as well, although it's primarily used to measure uh, fluorescence contrast. So their sensitivity to absorption is roughly two orders magnitude lower than photoacoustic tomography to absorption. Right, let me start with an extremely simple analogy. What does it take to get an image in photoacoustics? It's primarily triangulation of the sound wave. 
Let's say we want to pinpoint a single sound source, like a thunderbolt. When we see the lightning, we can reset our stopwatch. You know, we say that's time zero, because the light propagates so fast, we can ignore the light propagation time. When we hear the thunder, we can record a time delay, let's call that T1, multiply the time delay by the speed of sound in air, we can define a radius for a spherical shell on which lightning took place. If we have three such spherical shells, the intersection will allow you to triangulate the sound source. So we can pinpoint the sound source by recording the time delay. And that's an advantage for, light, for um, sound propagation. Uh, and Simon and I were talking about light propagation to record a light propagation time is a lot more challenging because you're talking about five orders of magnitude difference in the propagation speeds. Right? So this allows you to reduce one detection dimension because you have the time per dimension so the spatial dimension can be reduced. Now if you look at actually CT, you gotta do this type of linear scanning or a fan beam scanning. On top of it you gotta scan again rotationally. So in photoacoustics, you realize that we don't have to, we only need to do one of them. So oftentimes we do a rotational scanning or simply use a ring geometry for parallel detection. Plus the time, that's going to give you everything you need. So the scanning can be extremely fast from that regard. So that's the basic principle, really. It's extremely simple. Of course, when we deal with the real situation, let me start with the circular geometry for the acoustic CT. You gotta do more than just three detectors. You gotta use more. Normally we expand a laser beam, um, use a nanosecond laser pulse. We follow the ANSI safety limit. So that tells you how many millijoules per centimeter squared per laser pulse you can use. Right? That's a very conservative safety limit. So oftentimes it's order magnitude below the damage threshold in the most conservative case, meaning like maybe a very dark skin. Right? This applies to the visible spectral range. Well, we allow photons to scatter around, you know, make sure they go deeper so we can go beyond this uh, one millimeter diffu uh, diffusion limit. Light absorption will generate heating. Every milli-degree gives you 800 pascals pressure rise. And that's already detectable. But to get a better SMR, you want to have 10 times or 100 times that pressure rise. Right. What we do is we place a lot of ultrasound transducers to detect the photoacoustic wave. Then we use a mask to reconstruct the image. Now, because here you're dealing with a 3D unknown acoustic source, you need more than three detectors. To get a job done right, we need hundreds of detectors. The rule of thumb is about 256, or 512 detectors. Again, just to mention the low ultrasound scattering coefficient, it's roughly three orders magnitude difference. Right? That allows you to form a very good image by detecting the sound and reconstruct from there. This is the first set of functional photoacoustic images. We can shine light going through the skin and skull to reach the brain cortex to excite photoacoustic signals. And the acoustic signal will go through the skull and scalp to reach the ultrasound detectors. You can form an image like that to show the hemodynamic response to whisker stimulation. These are one-sided whisker stimulation that would allow you to stimulate the contralateral side of the brain. And you can see either side of the brain activation, non-invasively. So for the first time, this demonstrated the advantage of photoacoustic imaging um, in comparison to two-photon or confocal microscopy because you have to remove the skin and thin the skull, at least, if not to remove the skull, in order to get images. As a result, you can see after the publication of that paper in 03, our field doubled in size roughly every three years. So we've gone through this exponential growth, and it's still growing. After 2009, the conference on this topic became the largest in Photonics West, which is a 20,000 attendee conference, symposium, what we call it. So you wonder why 
this technology has grown so fast. There are many advantages. One of the key advantages, I think, is the multi-scale imaging capability in vivo with consistent contrast. Light absorption is the major contrast. We use the same contrast mechanism. Why is that important? This is a plot of penetration versus spatial resolution. You can see photoacoustics allows you to image from organelles through cells, tissues, all the way to organs. In current practice, we image organelles and cells we use optical microscopy. For tissues and organs, we switch to non-optics, ultrasound, micro CT, MRR, PET. So we're talking about vastly different contrast mechanisms. You have a huge divide between the cell and tissue level. Photoacoustic tomography allows you to bridge that gap and provide you a continuum from organelles all the way to organs. So that consistency allows us to enable many applications. For example, we can potentially enable systems biology research at multiple lens scales to allow you to correlate images acquired across lens scales. We can accelerate translation from microscopic lab discoveries to clinical practice. Physicians don't care about organelle levels on a patient. They deal with tissue and organ levels. This plot, every bar here represents one system in our lab. You can pick any depth range for your application. You can custom build uh, a system for that range. So you, look at, you notice here the scalability. Right? This dash line is a rough fit by going through all the systems. You have roughly a depth to resolution ratio of 200. That means you can get 200 pixels to work with, no matter how deep you want to get. Right, that's the important scaling factor. If you look at some of the other scale, high resolution modalities, you roughly get the same number. Like OCT, for example, penetrates about a millimeter. It gives you about 10 micro resolution. You divide the two numbers, you get about 100 as well. For the O3 work, we used a single element transducer rotated around the animal head, which took about 20 minutes. Obviously, that's too long for a lot of applications. So now we have access to a 512 element array, ultrasound array, that can receive data almost in parallel because we do have to go through multiplexing to finish the data collection. With this system, it takes about two seconds to acquire a 2D image. So you shorten the time from 20 minutes to about two seconds. This is a collaborative project with Professor Drew at UConn. Unlike X-ray CT, where X-ray travels straight through. So you work in transmission geometry. The photoacoustic wave propagates in all directions. Right? So that means your design geometry can be very versatile. Depending on which part of the body you want to image, you can you know, refine your geometry. For a trunk, we use sight illumination, bilateral detection. For a brain, we use top illumination, but the same lateral detection. So we can use the same detector array for many different anatomical sites. And this is a whole body image of a small animal. We scan along the trunk. You can get tomographic images. You know, each one shows your cross section. And this is another movie showing you along the kidney region. And you can see, zoom into here, that's a colon. It'll get in focus, then out of focus eventually. And so using endogenous contrast, you can get this type of images. And these are not the best images possible yet. We're still improving because in this image reconstruction, we assume the speed of sound is constant between tissue organs, different organs, and even between the bone and the soft tissue. Obviously, that's not quite correct. Right? We assume the water has the same speed as the soft tissue. So we're working now to map the speed of sound to correct for this um, ultrasound distribution of speed and get even sharper images down the road. And you can pick any organ and watch this movie. Recently we applied this for brain imaging. We're trying to map the resting state functional connectivity. So you're not stimulating the animal in any regard. You just let, let them sit there. Of course they're under, under anesthesia. Um, you can see the correlation between different maps that we've identified, you can go through all of them. At the same time, 
we can also stress the animal, but still looking at the resting state between normoxia and the hyperoxia. In normoxia, you can see the correlation, very strong correlation, but under hypoxia, the correlation stops. So it's a very striking difference. Okay. This hopefully can be used to excite your scientists to allow them to use our technique for their for their you know, basic science research in neuroscience. Obviously, it's an extremely exciting field. The hope is that we can play a part by providing the right tool for them. And this were acquired non-invasively. So you get reasonably high resolution for that type of studies. We can also use a different geometry. You know, the one I just talked about is a circular ring geometry. The next one is a linear geometry. In collaboration with Philip's research, we've adapted this clinical ultrasound machine for concurrent photoacoustic tomography. This is a standard handhold ultrasound probe. It's a linear array with typically 126 or more elements, or typically six elements. We flag this probe with two optical fiber bundles for light delivery. You fire a single laser pulse, illuminate the tissue volume below the linear probe, and you will require the photoacoustic signal in parallel that allows you to form a 2D image, what we call B-scan images, within, say, hundreds of microseconds, because that's when your signal will arrive. Right. So this is extremely fast data acquisition that allows you to minimize motion artifacts. You can see this bed right here, so you know we're targeting a lot of clinical applications. This system operates around here, multiple centimeters in penetration, uh, sub-millimeter resolution, in fact. This is one example demonstrating how, demonstrating how deep we can penetrate in biological tissue. Right, this is, uh, in fact, our first breast cancer patient we imaged. And you can see certain features at a depth of about six centimeters. Extremely encouraging. Our ex vivo de study demonstrated seven to eight centimeters, in fact. This is a breast tumor, you can see. Right, this is overlay uh, with grayscale ultrasound image where the color shows you the photoacoustic contrast. They actually match quite well in this case. Notice the laser fluence we use. So we're using one half of the ANSI safety limit, so there's really room for improvement in that regard. If you use stronger light delivery, you'll get a stronger signal as well, potentially deeper penetration or better SLR. Right, we're using a red wavelength to penetrate deep. The real application we're after right now is to stage the breast cancer. As we know, the current practice is a surgical procedure. You inject the radionuclei, you inject the organic dye like methane glue. Uh, they will just flow through your lymphatic system and accumulate at a central lymph node. The theory is, if the cancer has metastasized, they will start at a central lymph node, the first stringy node. So that's why it's important to identify the central lymph node. Once they surgically dissect the central lymph node, they go through standard histology. Any percent of the patients who go through that procedure turn out to be benign. Right? That's obviously very good news. But they got to go through the surgery. It's expensive, painful, and it has side effects. So one of the problems is lymphedema. Right? That's a lifelong disease once you have it. Right, we, want, we want to convert that surgical procedure into needle biopsy. The first aspect of this whole procedure is to identify the central lymph node using the dye accumulation. And that's an FDA approved dye already. Then we use a needle, guide a needle toward the central lymph node to take some cells out and followed by cytology. If we, if we find cancer cells, then you know that's positive already. So we're moving in that direction, but currently we simply clip that simple lymph node for confirmation of the simple lymph node. And this is one example, we radiograph the ex excised lesion to confirm that we've identified this simple lymph node. For comparison, you can see this needle track in the ultrasound image as well. The contrast from photoacoustic tomography is a lot higher than the ultrasound, right? because the ultrasound signal propagates primarily in the forward direction. 
a little signal is diffusely reflected. Unless you roughen the surface, which can help you to increase the scatter of the constitution. Let me uh, move on to uh, the other domain where we try to push the absolute resolution. Right? You do give up the penetration, so you're sliding on that uh, map I just showed. I'll talk about acoustic resolution version of photoacoustic microscopy first. Unlike photoacoustic CT, where we use unfocused ultrasound transducers, followed by mass to reconstruct the image. Here we use focused ultrasound transducers. Right. Assuming there is an optically absorbing target in a piece of tissue, scattering tissue, you fire an ultrasound pulse, you generate photoacoustic wave. The focused transducer receives the photoacoustic wave in a time resolved fashion, so your time of arrival is converted into depth. Because we know the speed of sound in soft tissue quite well. We multiply the time by the speed, we get that. So this depth resolve is simply based on the time resolution. Uh, again, that's hard to get in X-ray imaging, for example. The ultrasound focusing gives you lateral resolution directly. Uh, this is very much similar to ultrasound BC. The major difference is we have one-way ultrasound propagation where pulsex ultrasound requires round trip. In fact, we call this 1D image a scan image as well. Uh, this target will show up as a spike. If you have multiple targets, you'll see multiple spikes. Now, if you scan across the tissue, you get a 2D image or a B scan image. If you rational scan on the surface, you get a 3D image. So fundamentally, it's a 3, 3D image modality. This is a photograph of the first 3D photo of a microscope. You start from a laser. We usually like, like to use a tunable laser system so you can target different chromophores, different absorbers in the tissue. The light is delivered through a fiber. You can see this light beam coming out. We use a conical lens to convert this solid beam into a hollow beam. This key component is shown here in a close-up. So this hollow beam is refocused into the tissue. On the tissue surface, you have this donut beam. So we make the core of the beam dark to minimize the surface interference. The ultrasound detector is confocal with light il illumination to maximize the signal to noise ratio. So you see this little membrane window right here. We place the tissue below the membrane window and that membrane window allows you to transmit both light and sound. A single laser pulse gives you a 1D image. Then we rasa scan this head in the water tray to get a 3D image. This, is a, this system operates at this point. Right? This generation allows you to penetrate about 3 millimeters into scattered tissue at tens of microns in resolution. So you see the scalability of the image modality. It's excellent for skin imaging by using this system. Using endogenous contrast, namely hemoglobin absorption, which are in your red blood cells, you don't have to inject any contrast agents. You can see a, a map of the blood vessels. Right, this is a B scan showing you the skin structures. And this is a melanoma we imaged in vivo in a patient. So our physician is interested in finding out the depth of the melanoma and the 3D volume of the melanoma. The standard technique is to cut a piece of tissue out and define the depth. It's called the Bressel's depth. But depending on where you cut, you get different numbers. Sometimes you may not sample the correct position. So our dermatology chief, Dr. Cornelius, wants to know the entire 3D volume. Give us the entire geometry so we can plan the surgery. Photoacoustics images anything that absorbs light. That includes nanoparticles, includes organic dyes, or even proteins. Like fluorescence proteins as absorption as well. So let me just use one slide to give you a flavor of what we can do. This um, shows a set of images acquired using gold nano cages as the contrast agent. 
The bottom row shows just the bare nano cages. The top row shows the nano cages modified to target MSH, MSH receptors. These are hallmarks of melanoma. You can see a threefold enhancement in contrast by using the target at birth. So this is a form of molecular imaging. The nano cages through our collaborator, Dr. Shah, can be used to um, deliver drug as well. Because the cages are, are hollow, you can load the nano cages with drug and seal the pores at the corners of the nano cages with polymer. When you heat up the nano cages, the polymers will shrink, open up the pores, so the drug can be released. And when you cool off the nano cages, the polymers will reseal the pores. And you can come back and repeat the therapy. So this is you know, simultaneous imaging and therapy uh, using the same contrast again. We miniaturized the, the probe for endoscopic applications. Uh, this is the first 3D photo, uh, photo acoustic endoscope. Um, you deliver the light through this optical fiber. Light is reflected by this mirror surface toward a tissue. Some of the photoacoustic wave will come back and reflected by the mirror surface toward this ultrasound transducer. Right? With a single laser shot, you get a 1D A scan image. You can spin the mirror like this to get 2D images. Then you can uh, uh, retract the probe axially to get 3D images. Right, these are movies showing you the photoacoustic contrast and the ultrasound contrast. Right, they are co-registered automatically because we use the same ultrasound transducer to acquire both images. And this can be potentially useful in the GI tract uh, because standard optical endoscopy will not penetrate so deep. Now notice here we can penetrate roughly about 7 millimeters in the GI tract. And you can potentially detect some lesions that would have been missed using standard optical endoscopy. And uh, this technology will give you optical contrast. We can actually improve the resolution even further, what we call optical resolution for the acoustic microscopy. Um, in this modality, we're back within the uh, diffusion limit. So our penetration goal is roughly about a millimeter. In fact, our first generation penetrates about 1.2 millimeters. So you're coming on ballistic light, the straight propagating photons, to define your lateral resolution. So how well you focus your light determines your XY resolution in a lateral direction. Right? So the excitation volume determines one resolution. But their depth or axial resolution still comes from the acoustic time of arrival. That's determined by the bandwidth of your signal. Right? The bandwidth of the ultrasound transducer is a key uh, parameter here. So the essential component is here. It's a light sound combiner. Somehow we have to merge the acoustic and optical axes, make them coaxial. So we build this um, light sound combiner, which is made of two prisms with a gap in between. The gap is filled with liquid. Along the optical axis, the optical refractive indices are highly matched, giving you very high light transmission. But the acoustic impedances between the solid in the prism and the liquid in the gap are highly mismatched. As a result, your returning ultrasound will be reflected through this ultrasound transducer. Again, with a single laser shot, you will get a 1D image in the depth direction. All you have to do is to raster scan to get a 3D image. But with optical focusing, you can get even better transverse resolution in comparison to the previous version, which is the acoustic resolution version. This is the mouthpiece around this point. So we just transition from the acoustic resolution version down to here. You give up the depth, but you improve your resolution further. So we're going to get single digit micron resolution using this device. This is the one example. You can look at the same animal over a period of 60 days. You don't have to deal with interceptive variability. Right? You're monitoring the same animal, so there's a reference uh, just by using the same animal as the reference. You start from the baseline, you see this growth of new blood vessels, increase in tortuosity. 
This is a 3D rendering of the data set. So this is extremely powerful for basic research. We're working with our angiogenesis expert at Washington University. He had to sacrifice many animals if he wanted to get the same thing using invasive technique. And he had to deal with intersubject variability. This is another example image. And this one was acquired using a 2.6 micron lab resolution system. With this resolution, you can see every single blood vessel in the skin. So this is an image acquired of a mouse ear. You can zoom into a smaller area to see the details. Uh, you can see capillary beds, single capillaries. The dots are actually single red blood cells. That's a 3D rendering of the data set. Now, oxy and deoxy hemoglobin molecules have different colors. So we have two forms. That's why our veins look different from our trees. Uh, by using the laser wavelength difference, we can tune the laser wavelength that allows us to figure out the concentrations of both forms of hemoglobin, from which we can compute the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. You might have heard of pulse oximetry. That's based on that principle. They use two wavelengths to figure out the oxygen saturation. But in pulse oximetry, they go through the fingertip, for example. So very thin objects, works in transmission mode, volume average. They don't resolve vessels. They only allow you to sense arterial blood. So there's no measure of venous blood, which is actually sometimes very important in terms of quantifying oxygen delivery. So in a way, photoacoustics allows you to provide vessel-by-vessel -vessel oximetry of both arteries and veins. So this is vessel level oximetry. We can apply this in humans. We image our own finger cuticles. You can see this hairpin like capillary loops. And we can quantify the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. You can zoom into a small one, a single capillary loop like this. You can see loops around. What's strange is that one side of the loop is highly oxygenated, and the other side has much lower oxygen saturation. The sharpest gradient is at a tip, which means most of the oxygen is released at the tip of the capillary loop. Very interesting physiology. This is a recent. We just got a data this Monday, right? <laughs> and watch here. See that little black object? It stops there, then it goes through. And on this smaller vessel, you see a lot of black objects flowing through. You know, we suspect that's white blood cells because we're looking at the, uh, using a wavelength that's absorbed by red blood cells. Right? So we don't really fully understand this yet. We're still studying all of that. That's an extremely interesting one. Uh, that's pretty big because this vessel is several hundred microns in diameter. And this is obviously a vein. This narrow one is the artery. So you can see the capability of this system. Uh, to get this, we have to scan really fast. So we're working with Professor Zhou. He built a, a MEMS mirror that allows you to immerse the mirror in liquid and still scan. Most of the MEMS mirrors only scan air. When you put it in liquid, it will stop functioning. So this is a great invention. And also, we got hold of a very high rep rate laser. This laser sends up pulses half a million times per second. So the combination of different technologies allow this to happen. So obviously, you are going to look for more applications using this technology. This is just initial demonstration of capability. So we can acquire this. This is actually a 3D image. Acquire this entire 3D image within two seconds. Actually, within half a second. So this is a two hertz volumetric rate. Now, our neurology department is also interested in photoacoustics. What can we do in the brain again? This is what you see. You depilate the area of the skin, so remove the fur. Our vision will not be able to go through the skin and skull to reach the brain cortex. There is simply too much turbidity going on here. This is what we see at this point. We can go through the skin and skull to reach the brain cortex, get a structure of the cortical blood vessels, using that 512 element photoacoustic CT system. Now, if you remove the skin, the 
this, the movie stuff. This is what you see with the naked eye. Right? The skull is intact, but the skull is translucent enough for us to see all the detailed structures. You compare this non-invasive photoacoustic image with this invasive photograph. You see how well they match all the bifurcation points. Now at this point, if you bring the higher resolution version for the acoustic microscopy, right, the optical resolution version, you see something like this. So our eye, our vision will miss a lot of small vessels that are either deeper or just too small to see. Right. We're now applying this technology with our neurology department for various disease models, scope model, Alzheimer's disease model in mice. Now this is a stimulation technique you can see. If you use four-paw or hind-paw stimulation, electrically you'll see activation of blood vessels on a vessel by vessel level. Right, this can be potentially used to study bold signal mechanisms and Vivek and I were talking about this more. Now, more recently we demonstrated that this is a technique that allows you to image blood flow by using a Doppler effect. So just like any waves, ultrasound wave has Doppler effect, optic wave has Doppler effect, photoacoustic waves have Doppler effect. So by taking advantage of the Doppler effect, we quantify the blood flow. With that information, on top of the hemodynamic information we image already, like the total concentration of hemoglobin, the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, we measure the size of the blood vessels. The combination of, of all these parameters allowed us to quantify MRO2, namely, the metabolic rate of oxygen, so that it tells you how quickly oxygen is consumed. That's obviously a very important metabolic parameter. At the same time, we can quantify whether this region is hyperoxic or not. It turned out, in early stage cancer, this is one week um, after the inoculation of these tumor cells, we can see hyperoxia instead of hypoxia. Right? This is because much increase the blood flow. Uh, you bring so much oxygen to this tumor region, you have excess, uh, you, you have excess in, um, tumor, in blood oxygenation instead. But this could be a very interesting combination for early stage cancer screening. You know, can we one day use this for human skin cancer or uh, other regions uh, for early cancer screening? You know, this does not require injection of any contrast agents. It doesn't use any ionized radiation. So it's entirely safe to do. We're trying to push oximetry to the ultimate level. Um, can we do it on a single cell level? So we build a device that operates like this. I slow down the movie to one hertz so you can see how the system operates. Uh, then if we operate at 20 hertz, it goes, it goes like this. But we actually operate at 200 hertz. So you won't be able to respond to 200 hertz. At 200 hertz, we get 3D movies like that. So you'll see single red blood cells, watch them bifurcate. It's interesting, right? You know, physiologically speaking, you see how the red blood cells split. It's not entirely random, not entirely even, right? Sometimes you'll see red blood cells getting stuck somewhere, and then eventually it'll go through. If we wait long enough, we'll see that example, right? Well, you watch this, if you can time share on this side, on this side, we pick a segment of a capillary, fire two laser pulses, only 20 microseconds apart, but the two laser pulses have two different wavelengths. So that means by using two different laser wavelengths, we can quantify the concentrations of both oxy and deoxyhemoglobin molecules, from which we compute SO2, the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. So we're watching single cell oxygen saturation, like this. This is a pseudo color of oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. We're watching single cells release oxygen as they travel in a capillary segment. So now that's oximetry at the most fundamental level. You can't go down to the hemoglobin level, right? Because you have to have a carrier to watch the oxygen release. And you can see those red blood cells stuck right here. Don't worry, eventually they'll go through. <laughs> you want long enough. So you got to wait long enough to see that happen.
<laughs> pushing your patience, right? So that's uh, anyway. You know, I don't know what's going on in my body, of course. Uh, now I mentioned about histology. You know, as we uh, talked about a little bit before, with standard histology, you got cut a tissue up. But that's a gold standard between radiology and pathology. These are the two important eyes of any physician. Right? But radiology is not invasive, pathology is terribly invasive and takes a long time as well. So can we bring histology or pathology to in vivo? We use DNA and RNA absorption as a contrast mechanism. We can map out the cell nuclear distribution like this. This is obviously pseudo-colored. We map uh, the cell nuclei in blue and the uh, rest in pink just to mimic standard HD stain. So you can see the same piece of tissue was processed using standard HG staining. You can see the strong correlation between the two. So can we use this technology to demarcate cancer in real time in OR? It allows physicians to get pathology type of image quality. Because that's the gold standard, that might be a very good starting point. We're not you know, giving them new parameters, you said you figure out if this is cancer or not. All we need to ask the pathologist to treat this image as if they were looking at it under microscope, invasively. So we're moving this with our MD uh, breast surgeon, try to demarcate the tumor margin first. Obviously, this can be applied anywhere, in any surgery. Now, let me use one slide to talk about the recent development, where we break through the optical diffraction limit, land over two. The standard optical imaging gives you a resolution when you use the highest possible MA, it gives you lambda over 2 as your resolution. Wavelength divided by 2. Here, this is the lambda over 2 version, so it's about 230 nanometer resolution. We use a very high MA. Right? This is the super resolution version. We break through that diffraction limit. Right? This is the improvement by a factor of 2.5 or so. We extracted the nonlinear effect out of this uh, observation of the signal to give you this type of super resolution. And you can see the difference between the standard image and the super resolution image. So the hope is that this technology will be even more broadly adopted by biologists. Here's a quick discussion in summary. Where's the next challenge? To me, the biggest challenge is to image human brain, adult brain most ideally. Because what do you have nowadays? Functional MRI. Right? It's a great technology, right? It's very useful, has generated great impact, but has reasonably poor resolution. Even though the structural MRI gives you fantastic resolution, when you switch to bold MRI, functional MRI, your resolution degrades, maybe by a factor of three or so. Right? So you're getting maybe three millimeter resolution instead. And it's very slow, and not to mention it's clunky, uh, expensive. So we're trying to try photoacoustic tomography in the human brain, and crazy enough to try it will work in the adult human brain. The major challenge is all this thick skull. Right? That's, this is how our brain is protected. Uh, Post-echo ultrasound in the in adult brain doesn't really work very well. So that's a major challenge. You know, how do we convince people when you photoacoustics you have a better chance? So we do have some advantages uh, in our favor because photoacoustic wave goes one way out. And then also the pulse echo only returns maybe 0.1% of your signal back in amplitude. So it's a small percentage of the ultrasound signal that will go back, return uh, for pulse echo ultrasound imaging. So we said, well, let's give it a shot. We got hold of this ex vivo human skull, adult skull, and this is a photograph of that. This is an X-ray CT image. And we put a dark brain here, stick it into this human skull, because we don't have the original human brain. <laughs> what do you expect to get? It's going to be better than a white screen, right? Look at this. So we managed to see the gyri in this brain. And that's, to us, that's extremely exciting because it shows there might be a possibility. The hope is that can we do this in vivo? If this can be ever done, we can image human brain with functional parameters with richer contrast 
the function of MRI because we can image both oxy and deoxy hemoglobin reliably. We can image even water and any other absorbers where function of MRI is primarily sensitive to deoxy hemoglobin. Right? We are much faster in terms of data acquisition. If you have enough array elements for ultrasound detection, a single laser shot will allow you to form the image. And the ultrasound will, receive, will be received within, say, 100 microseconds. That's how fast you can get an image. So you minimize motion artifacts altogether. So that's an extremely exciting direction, but we're not quite there yet. We're still imaging X people. But this is a very, very new data. What else? So I mentioned that you know at most photoacoustic tomography you can penetrate 10 centimeters. And there are deeper regions you want to reach. Is there any way to go beyond that limit and reach tens of centimeters, multiple tens, like you know, 50 centimeters, for example, or even close to a meter. That's crazy, right? Call me crazy. So we're trying to push in that direction because the scattering in combination with absorption limits you to 10 centimeters for a photoacoustic tomography. But if you can overcome scattering, if you can take out all the scatterers in tissue, absorption is the only limitation. But if you take the right wavelengths, the absorption is so weak, the 1 over E length is already 10 centimeters. You multiply 10 centimeters by 10, you get 100 centimeters, you're approaching a meter. So we can potentially use, use light to image elephant. If that'll work. All right, so why are we pushing that direction? You have to overcome scattering. Right? In, the interest of, in the interest of time, let's just focus on this movie. In astronomy, you can use a guy star to get a point spread function, and you can correct for the aberration due to the atmosphere. And as a result, you can form a very sharp image of a target star. But in biological tissue, we don't have a guy star to begin with. So what we do is to focus ultrasound beam here. Coherent laser light can be modulated by this ultrasound wave, the ultrasound focus beam. Uh, that tags photons by shifting the ultrasound frequency, by shifting the frequency of the light beam. Outside the tissue, we use a phase conjugate mirror that only receive uh, the frequency shifted component of the light. Now we time reverse it back. That time reverse version will reach the ultrasound focus. So this is for the first time we're able to focus relatively deeply in scattered biological tissue through this time reversal. We call this time reverse ultrasound encoded or true optical focusing. And this now has become a very hot topic. Several groups are really moving this technology forward. It's great to see that. Here's a quick summary. Now we're running out of time. Um, Photoacoustic tomography is based on light excitation and ultrasonic detection, but they're integrated in a single modality. The optical diffusion limit has been broken. We penetrated up to about 7 uh, centimeters. If you penetrate from both sides, obviously you double. So you can image really sizable objects already. You know, the breast is a great starting point, brain. Not to mention neonatal brain or infant brains, okay, the, where the fontanelles are open, so that's a great window for light delivery and ultrasound transmission. Not to mention the size, and also infant tissues are more transparent optically. We've demonstrated single capillaries, cells, organelles, and they can be imaged. And we demonstrate the best resolution of 90 nanometers. That's a super resolution, uh, really breaking through the, the uh, diffraction limit. Multi-scale imaging comes from scaling the depth and resolution. In a lot of times, you just have to scale the ultrasound frequency. And this scalability applies to ultrasound imaging as well. The sensitivity to optical absorption is actually at 100%. Right, that's a very high sensitivity. On the other hand, we're not very sensitive to scattering. Right? If scattering is your contrast mechanism you're after, then you've got to pick something else. Either fluorescent or non-fluorescent pigments can be detected. So if you depend on fluorescence, of course, you've got to depend on a reasonably high fluorescence quantum yield. Right? Only a subset of molecules are fluorescent. In theory, all molecules are absorbing. You've got to find the absorbing bands. Right, to, to find the optimal absorption. 
Multiple chromophores can be resolved spectrally. Functional imaging is possible for endog from endogenous absorbers uh, like oxy and deoxy hemoglobin molecules. Molecular imaging is enabled by targeted contrast agents. Reporter genes can be imaged as well. I don't have time to talk about it. You know, we, we re imaged all sorts of reporter genes. Doppler imaging has been shown that provides you metabolic imaging. The data acquisition is very fast, depending on the range of the data acquisition. There are no spec artifacts you might have realized. Right? A little different from OCT imaging or ultrasound pulse echo imaging. But transmission ultrasound tomography generates spec-free images as well. We use non laser mediation, very safe. The systems are relatively low cost. Right? So this is relatively in the medical imaging world. So that's a photo of uh, our group and party. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wang, for that incredible uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to open up for questions. Yes, oh, spectacular talk. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Really good. Um, can you tell us something about the spectrum of ultrasound frequencies you generate and whether that has anything to do with the, um, the pulse char characteristics of the laser pulse you put in? Great question. So, um, at a source, you have some absorber, you fire laser pulse. If you Typically, we start with a few nanoseconds pulse width. So at a source, if you have a point absorber, it's going to generate a spectrum as broad as maybe about 100 megahertz. So it's quite broad. But that signal, as it propagates, will become narrower and narrower because the higher frequency portion of the spectrum will go out faster, will be attenuated by tissue faster. So it's very different from X-ray. You know, X-ray as you go through tissue, it becomes hardened, but you know, ultrasound becomes softened in a way. Um, so the deeper you go, the deeper, longer distance you propagate, the narrower the band. The rule of thumb is 30 megahertz centimeter. So the frequency depth product is roughly a constant in soft tissue. For example, three megahertz corresponds to, you know, 10 centimeters, all right? So that product is roughly constant. And that allows us to scale. And that product also translates into about 200 pixels in the depth direction. So these are related. You can convert a frequency into axial resolution. Then it becomes a depth to resolution ratio as opposed to a product. Great question. So for microscopy, if you only want to penetrate, say, several millimeters, instead of using 5 or 10 megahertz, we use 50 or 100 megahertz. So you can afford to use high frequency and still penetrate ultrasonically. And that gives you, obviously, much better resolution in return. Can you tell us something about, in the, in the deep tissue imaging, about quantification? So how do you account for the depth dependence of the attenuation of the, of, of the laser light. Right, right. How, how do you quantify it? Because that's, yeah. that's a big challenge, I would Right, imagine. right, right. You know, obviously that's a very generic problem in a lot of imaging modalities. For example, the, the pulse echo ultrasound. You know, your ultrasonic energy is going to dissipate as it goes through. So one trick is to uh, use time gain compensation. Right, that's invented in the ultrasound imaging world. So the deeper region, you multiply that gain factor. That basically one, uh, you know, um, one minus or not one minus, just a, a negative of the attenuation coefficient becomes the gain factor uh, that allows you to compensate. But it's somewhat empirical. Um, so the fluence as you go deeper and deeper, it does drop. So there are different, you know, layers in depth will receive different fluence levels. So even if you have the same absorption coefficient at two different depths, they will return different photoacoustic signals. So it's a um, the non-invasive approach. Several groups are studying that. One way is to combine diffuse optic tomography with photoacoustic tomography. So DOT allows you to map the fluence distribution in a blurry way, but 
it might be adequate because the fluence distribution is blurry anyway. In fact, you can prove mathematically the fluence distribution is continuous as long as the tissue refractive index is the same, which is a very good approximation because the index variation is on you know, the second decimal point in balance of tissue. But we're looking for some non-emissive methods. We've had some success already, especially in the microscopy world, either acoustic resolution or optical resolution. In blood vessels, that's the major interest. When light goes through blood vessels, the scattering is negligible. So you have a known exponential decay inside the blood vessel. And that's manifested as acoustic spec spectrum. So by examining the acoustic spectrum, we managed to figure out the decay curve. And that's a relative measurement, very much like Laura's lifetime measurement. That's independent of the concentration. So that decay curve is independent of the local fluence. So that's in independent of the light level. And that's one method. And there are some other invasive methods. Like, for example, you can insert a needle. Minimally invasive, but not terribly invasive, but still invasive. And that needle has a known absorption spectrum. And so, if you insert it, you can calibrate your fluence on a relative level between different wavelengths at every depth. So that's another way to do to deal with that issue. But it's not a finally solved problem yet. You know, our field is still working on that problem. Terrific question. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, excellent talk. And thank you. You mentioned about the uh, oxygen is the oxygen in the blood. So multiplex to multiplex. Can you? How far can you push? Can you put the six, seven, ten color? Uh, so far, we pushed as many as three. So, in theory, you can go to more. Uh, in practice, you got to watch the inversion stability. Uh, ultimately, it's all SNR limited. So, the matrix inversion has this so-called condition number, right? Mathematicians have worked all that out. So if a matrix has a low condition number, and then you don't have to have a very high SMR to invert it. Otherwise, you have to push the SMR to make sure that inversion number is not going to generate garbage. Right. So uh, with two wavelengths, you can do that very reliably by choosing the right, the right wavelength pair. But three, you can still do that very reliably in a very rapid fashion. But as you push to six or more, you just need to design very carefully. This obviously will depend on how widely the spectra are separated from the six absorbers. So if they're well isolated, you know, you can easily separate them. You can fire one, one wavelength at a time even. But if they overlap like hell, then you gotta work harder to separate them. So in principle, if you have exogenous probe, they put in that far apart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can easily do that. I mean, if it's, uh, the, at, at the exogenous absorbing wavelength, if there's nothing coming from the background, uh, the endogenous background, you can easily separate that. Do you have the laser technology to do that? Right. Well, we have, for example, we have one laser that allows you to tune the wavelength from 200 nanometers all the way to 2 microns. It's, you know, the technology is out there. Right. Yeah. High speed. It's, uh, well, the tuning, the, it's reasonably high speed, right, depending on what you mean by high speed. So you do have to use a dispersion element, you mechanically rotate it, so that could be automated. Right? You can then, you know, reasonably high speed. And there are ways to speed up the transition by using some other elements. You know, sometimes you can have multiple wavelengths fired at the same time, you people, you know, if it's a discrete wavelength you want to work on. Okay. You want great talk. Hi. Uh, Thank you. So, are there any known or potential side effects of this technology? Well, so you look at the uh, light and sound, right? These are two forms of energy we're using. First of all, on the sound side, you generate typically millibars pressure, and yeah, that's orders of magnitude than the pulse echo ultrasound signal. So, with pulse echo ultrasound, you send bars of signal in you get millibars out because the backscattering coefficient is really low, actually. Uh, so the ultrasound is absolutely safe. With the optical part, you follow the ANSI safety limit. 
And again, that's extremely conservative. Right? The NC limit, the damage threshold depends on the color of the skin. Usually in the visible spectrum range, the darker the skin, the higher the melanin concentration, the lower the damage threshold. But the ANC, because it's a safety standard, they use that you know, lowest damage threshold, roughly divided by order of magnitude, they define that as the safety standard, usually at the worst wavelength. You look at you know, the visible spectral range, at 420, you got this sorry band, and then you go to 560, you got a Q band, but there's an order of magnitude difference in terms of absorption coefficient already. Then you go to some of the red, right, until 700, that's another order of magnitude difference. So you're talking about two order of magnitude difference within that spectral range already. And for deep tissue imaging, we oftentimes use the red or near infrared wavelength. So there's one order of magnitude safety guard by ANC. There's two order of magnitude difference within the visible spectral range. Having said that, for clinical <laughs> applications, you're allowed to go above the ANC limit as long as you guarantee safety, right? Because you're really benefiting the patients. So you know, right now we try to stay within ANC so we can go through the IRB real easily, but eventually if this technology matures, we like to go even higher as long as we make sure it's safe. You know, one nice thing about this technology is your photoacoustic wave measures how much heat, how much temperature rise you're generating. So you can really monitor what's going on at any given depth. You can start from a low pulse energy. You can monitor it, and you actually you know, estimate how much temperature rise you're generating then you can go higher as long as you know at that new level you're not generating any damage. Because the damage the analysis is or pulse wave is thermally based. And so it's a fantastic tool just to monitor how much energy you're depositing directly. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I was curious about your um, imaging here of um, Red blood cells. Uh, is that real time, or do you have to? Is that do a lot? That's of real this? time. Yeah. So how do you deal with the bulk motion? Do you have some kind of uh, real time bulk motion? Uh, well, this here? is because like I, your those your skin. Aren't that stable, are they? Your, your skin. Well, you do have some motion artifacts, but you're we're scanning these scans at um, 200 hertz, and this 3D image was scanned at 20 hertz. So you're scanning at almost a video rate of the 3D images. You're scanning fast enough. We, we also stabilize the image region. So that's in contact mode. If you have three, if you have non-contact, right. you got breathing motion and yeah. everything going on. So that contact actually minimizes the motion artifact. Okay. And plus, you, you really need high imaging rate to begin with. We have one more thing. We have one more thing. Professor Warren, this, it's a pleasure to, to have you here, and we want to offer you a little memento. This is something that was created in the uh, fast prototyping facility here. The team? Well, yes. 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 yes, the team. Or pre-team. And, and it was designed by Laura Marcou. Wow. <laughs> Shows uh, thunder and lightning. Wow! <laughs> symbolizing your photoacoustic Thank you. imaging. And yeah. then over here is something from the Saatchi Gallery in London, which uh, is called uh, Beethoven's trumpet. Wow! You got so, a copyright. <laughs> so it's just for you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us.